just had the Creighton EXB out for a spin. With its 2000 KVA motor and 6S, this truck really rips. So I started thinking, what if I doubled that KVA by stealing the motor? It's 4000 KV from this 110 scale lightweight racing buggy, and I stuck it in here. Maybe it would go twice as fast. Now, if you're not sure whether that idea is a good idea or a bad idea, or why, maybe this video is for you. Hey, welcome to the Mile High Speed RC Garage, everyone. Today, we're going to be talking about the basics of electronic selection for your RC vehicles. Not selecting for the highest levels of performance or racing or doing speed runs, anything like that just for the beginner to help them get a baseline for the various scales of vehicles and what their appropriate electronics might be. And yes, we are going to run this Crate EXP on a 4000 KVA 3650 motor. So we know not everyone likes to do the deep dives that we do on this channel. We believe knowledge is power, but some of you just want to get out and get RC and then we get that. So here are my own sort of established baselines for the various scales of cars. And there's a lot of wiggle room here. This is certainly not definitive. This is just where I've started and where you can begin at. But if you're curious about how we get to these selections and the science behind them, we'll stick around. So electronic selection could be pretty complicated and we could probably do like five half hour videos on this, but we're gonna try and compress this one down into say 15 minutes tops if we can and break it into four digestible parts that I think we all connect. So check the timestamps and navigate around. And with that, let's get stuck in. So what are these four main categories we're gonna look into? Well, the first one's gonna be context is everything. The second one is size matters. The third one is heat is bad. And the fourth one is things can only spin so fast. So let's start with our first category, which is context is everything. And let's do that by getting to running this Creighton EXP on a 3650 4000 KVA motor. There you go, so that's a 3650. No heat at all, no problems. Okay, I know you're disappointed. I know you guys were hoping you could see this car catch on fire and burn to the ground. And it's a high probability that could happen running that motor in this car. And you'll get to understand that the more you watch this video. But it didn't happen. And why didn't it happen? Well, because I didn't give you the context of how I was going to drive that car. I didn't tell you I was going to run it on flat pavement. I didn't tell you I was going to gear it real low. I didn't tell you I was only going to run it at half speed. I didn't tell you I was only just going to run it up and down my flat paved driveway. I didn't give you the context of how I was going to run it. So it's really just an overblown, exaggerated scenario to show you that you can't just go to a forum and say, what are the right electronics for my car without putting in context how you want to run your car and what your goals are. Now our next major concept is things can only spin so fast. And as you've probably figured out, there's only one electronic component you have that's actually mechanically moving, and that's the motor. So clearly we're talking about the spin rate of the motor, and let's just pause for a moment to appreciate what these things are doing. The, this motor can spin up to 50,000 RPM, so that's 850 revolutions per second. That's 85 revolutions every tenth of a second. Now that's amazing. But just like everything on this earth, it's mechanically driven. Things can only go so fast before bad things start to happen. All right, so number one is just pure friction. Things are spinning in here so quickly. They're generating tons of heat that's gonna, it's just gonna melt components inside the motor and break it down. The second thing that's gonna happen 
is that just mechanically things cannot hold themselves together when they're spinning at rates that are this quick. Um, check out this incredible video from the slow motion guys. They have a lot of cool stuff and a lot of neat videos. But they're actually spinning an apple here at an incredible rate to the point the apple can't even hold its own structure together and it explodes. Now that's pretty cool. So what is the maximum a motor like this can take? Well, it's different for every motor, different for every manufacturer, but typically around 50,000, 60,000 is where these are sort of maxing out at their peak. Will it do more than that? Yeah, probably will. Um, but if the motor's not well maintained or whatever, no, it won't. So right around 50,000 is about where you're gonna max out. But for, luckily for us in RC, we have this number or this range that turns out works really well for these RC motors for virtually any kind of setup and scale of car. And that's about 36 to 38,000 RPMs. For whatever reason, if you're, if you're kind of setting up for that range, you get a good blend of good speed, good acceleration for all around driving without building up too much heat in your components. When you go above that, it seems to, you, you end up having a lot of heat problems. You have to control it. And when you go below that, your car's just not very much fun to drive. And keep in mind that that number is based on your pack's voltage at its storage level. When you charge that pack up to its full capacity, you're actually gonna be going uh, a little more than 36 to 38. So how do you know if you're in that range? It's very simple, simple math equation. You take your battery pack's voltage times the KVA of your motor. And so it's very handy if you know Excel or Google Sheets or just want to do it by hand to create a very large chart with all the different types of battery packs, uh, voltages, and all the different motor KVAs down the side. And you'll be able to find the range of RPM of virtually any motor matched to any battery pack. So here you can see we've got a 3S pack matched to a 3200 KVA motor, which gives you this nice 35,000 RPM range. That's right where you want to be. All right, next up is size matters. And we're going to look at that in three different ways. And the first one's got to be the easiest concept of all. Does the stuff even simply fit in the vehicle you're trying to stuff it in? I mean, this car is designed for a 2S battery. And this, four, this is a 4S pack. There's nowhere to physically put this battery. It, it simply can't even carry it, much less if, you, you know, if you're gonna try and attempt to do 6S. Right, this is a 3650 motor that fits nicely into this car. A 3660, uh, yeah, that's starting to push it. It's getting a little big. Uh, going any further and we're kind of just getting ridiculous. Like this, this motor can't fit this vehicle physically. There's nowhere I can even stuff it in here. So number two is just because we can physically stuff the things in the car doesn't mean it really fits the car and matches up to the way the car is built and the car's infrastructure. But look what putting this motor in the car does. See this back end sag and put six S worth of batteries in the car. And the car barely, the suspension can't even take it. The chassis is going to snap the first bump you hit. This is just not a good idea. This motor mount, for example, is engineered to fit a 3650 motor and does so quite nicely. But to try and put this motor on, no chance. This will bend, which will damage the motor mount. That'll in turn damage your gears, they'll shred your gears, and you'll probably end up with some internal structural damage like this to your drivetrain. So again, just because you can fit something in the car doesn't mean it really fits the car. Okay, concept number three in size matters is just trust and believe that most of the time a larger motor is going to produce more torque than a smaller motor. Now, not always true, but what is torque? Well, torque is just force rotationally. So when we push things, that's force in a linear sense. We get that. When you take that linear force and turn it rotationally, it just becomes torque and that's what your motors are producing to propel your car and larger things typically create more force take this elephant here for example this elephant is going to be able to create more force than my little dog Millie and 
motors, larger motors create more torque than smaller motors given the same amount of power, typically. So what is, how does that influence your car? Well, if you put too big a motor in your car, there's too much force for your drive train components, your differentials, your out drives, your drive cups, all these things can kind of just explode under this instant shot of power that and torque and force that the big motor is able to supply to it. If you pick too small a motor, then it just doesn't have enough force. That's what happened here. This motor doesn't have enough force to physically move a car this big and this heavy. And what it ends up happening is it starts to generate too much heat. And what a great segue to our next item, which is heat is bad. All right, guys, so heat is bad, but where does it come from? So this can all get pretty complicated, and I don't want you to have to get an electrical engineering degree just to be able to run an RC car. So let's just think of two concepts that are not technically correct, but they will help you to understand where all this heat is coming from in your electrons. So all you electrical engineers take a deep breath. We know this isn't 100% technically correct, so you can save all your comments. It's just to help us understand where all this heat is coming from. So let's dive in. What are these two concepts? First, when electricity flows, it encounters resistance. And when it encounters resistance, it creates heat. Number two, the more electricity flows, the more resistance it encounters and the more heat is generated. So those two things are directly proportional. More energy flow, more resistance equals more heat. Okay, these are internal resistors that are part of your components. It's things like kinks in your wires create resistance. It's the wires themselves. When electricity flows, it rubs against the wires, creates resistance. Uh, when the electricity jumps from one connector to another connect through a connector, that's resistance or through other components. That's all resistance that's building up generating heat internally and in our analogy the more power you send through the more electricity across those resistors the more heat you're going to generate so all those things are internal resistance inherent within your electronics and they're always going to build up heat but i want you to think of another concept of uh, resistance that's actually external to your car that's going to affect your electronics anything that's externally resisting your car from moving forward um, maybe you put too much weight in the car maybe you bought these big heavy knobby tires maybe you're driving through snow and grass and mud uh, gearing is a big one that affects it gearing is essentially just us externally loading and unloading the vehicle um, for more on that concept we've got a video um, Gearing 101, which will explain that. Um, you can check out the link here. Um, but these are all external resistors that keep my car from moving forward. And what that does is it makes the electronics ask for more power. And we just talked about more power, more electrical flow equals more resistance equals more heat. So how do we combat all this heat? Well, externally, it's pretty easy. We just, um, we've talked about all the methods that you would do to unload your car, gear it properly, make sure the tires match your car, uh, don't drive through deep mud, tall grass. Internally, it's a little trickier. You can make sure that your wires aren't bent or crimped, that you don't have those kind of restrictions in. You can limit the number of transitions, you know, across capacitors, limit your number of connections. You can select bigger things, bigger electronics, because actually, the more volume the less resistance you have. Use bigger wires, use bigger connectors, use an EC5 instead of an EC3. The more things you can scale up that still fit in your car, the better off you'll be. And then the last thing we can do is just let it, accept the fact it's gonna build up and then just try and remove it as best we can. So we do that with heat sinks, fans. You can get creative and, and vent air across the electronics somehow through your body like this. Um, whatever you can do to help remove the heat that's getting in there. Hey, so there you have it, folks. The basics of selecting your electronics for your car. 
let's see how that applies going all the way back to running this, trying to make the decision to run this car on a 3650 4000 kVA motor. So number one, we had context is everything. Well, I actually got my context right. Um, I ran it on a really flat surface. I ran it at half throttle. I just kind of moved it up and down the driveway. It was a cold day. I got all my context right, and that really, that's the only reason I got away with running it. So check the box on context. Size matters. Well, the first part of that, does it physically fit the car, was kind of easy. Yes, it did. I actually downsized the motor, so of course it fit in there really easy. But the second part, does it really match the vehicle? No, it didn't match at all. This, this motor's undersized. The connectors are smaller, the capacitors are smaller, the wires are smaller on this motor. Everything's smaller, so it would have generated a lot of resistance, a lot of heat. Um, the second part of that is the motor's just too small to generate the torque necessary to move this vehicle. So it would have demanded a lot of power in order to overcome that limitation and more power equals more resistance equals more heat. So now how about um, things can only spin so fast? Well this motor is a uh, 4000 kVA motor. On 6S, uh, we go back to our chart, you'll see that's 88,000 RPM. That's way too much for this motor. Just mechanically at 88,000 RPMs, the thing would just split apart like our Apple and just explode it. So there's kind of just a roadmap for how you kind of use these concepts to help you select your components. The one thing we haven't talked a lot about is the ESC, and that's pretty typical. Um, normally your motor drives a lot of your electronic decision then you pick an appropriately matched battery for that motor and then the ESC just comes along for the ride. Sometimes it'll be the battery because maybe you can't fit any certain size battery into your car so you're going to start there and then pick an appropriate motor to match that battery. Again, the ESC just kind of comes along for the ride. And so sizing your ESC, you can do this through some mathematics and some other things, but it gets pretty complicated and I recommend just kind of sticking to the baseline selections that we put in the video earlier, that is a pretty good guide for just making sure that your ESC will match what the, either the battery or the motor selection. So there you have it, folks. There's kind of a electronics in a nutshell, if you can. We tried to burn through that as quick as we could. Um, hopefully this helps you with some, you know, just establishing some baseline uh, electronic selections for your car, and I hope it helps.